This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, and welcome in for another episode of For the Good of the Game. My name is John Davis, JD, and I'm your host. Our special guest today is Coach Melanie Red. Melanie is a strength and conditioning expert, certified speed and agility coach, functional movement expert, and owner of Melanie Red Performance Training. Coach Mel has been helping people achieve optimal strength and performance for over a decade and has developed and coached performance and strength programs for athletes and adults around the world. She is the head strength and conditioning coach for Chaminade Julianne High School and oversees strength and conditioning programs for all sports. While Coach Mel is best known for her work in football, her mission is to get all athletes from all sports in weight rooms across the country. Finally, Melanie is, is skilled in sport coach education, helping coaches around the globe execute safe and effective programs via her platform entitled MRPT Performance Pack. So it was with great gratitude and pleasure that I welcome Melanie Red to the show today. Melanie, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. This is really, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, the chats that we've had prior to uh, going live here on the podcast. And I, I really wanted to, so we can set the context for this discussion. I wanted to give you a chance to tell folks, you know, why you got into strength and performance training and, and what fuels you as you go through this, this track with your athletes. Yeah. Um, well, basically, you know, when I started um, my work, um, I started in like general fitness training for adults. Um, and then over the years, I had some adults and some friends who um, asked me if I could work with their teenager who was, you know, playing sports. And um, it was during that process where I just kind of dipped my toe in the water, which was about five or six years ago. Um, started to dip my toe in the water with youth athletes, I had no idea how underserved um, these kids were in, in strength and conditioning. I assumed that um, because colleges have strength coach, obvious coaches, I've heard about that. Um, and although I didn't have a strength coach or a coach that knew how to do strength training, um, when I was in high school, I just assumed that it was a thing now because, you know, it, that was a very long time ago. And so that was really eye opening to me. And then I start hearing the stories predominantly from girls soccer um, about the ACL tears and non contact injuries. And then I started going down that rabbit hole of like, why is this happening? And, um, you know, what is what are the biomechanic issues? And really what that all boiled down to was a simple fix that, you know, these athletes could um, largely prevent, you know, injuries through really good quality strength um, and speed, um, uh, you know, and flexibility programs. Um, so to me, I'm like, it's so simple. Why are we not doing this? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was around that time um, that I started working with a mentor and he was really pushing me really hard to figure out what I wanted to do with my career because in this time frame, I was really dissatisfied with my career and I was just kind of going through the motions and I had a lot of clients and they were great. It wasn't them. It was me. <laughs> and I just was like, gosh, this is not like really lighting me up anymore. I don't know. I, I need to do something that like I have a fire, sure. you know, about. And so he was pushing me really hard and we explored every niche. Um, and then um, I, in that time, as I was opening my mind up to what the niche was going to be, I just happened to meet um, somebody named Maurice Harden. Uh, we call him Coach Mo. And it was a, it was like a chance meeting. And, um, he is an exercise science instructor at a local trade school. So like for high schoolers, um, and I did, I thought I was meeting with him to join his advisory board. I thought that would be really cool. Um, which I'm still on to this day, but I did not know that he was the offensive coordinator at Chaminade Julien at the time and was also running um, the strength and conditioning program there. So he invited me to come and look at the team from like the functional movement perspective and just give, 
you know, my thoughts on what maybe they could do to um, improve or whatever. And so they had a really great program already. Um, but I went and um, as soon as I walked in the door, the weight room was full of football players and it was loud and the weights were clanking and the energy was just like, it made the hair on my arm stand up and it still does. Like when I tell this story sure. and I tell this story at least three times a week to somebody, but I still like the hair on my arm still stands up. And I knew immediately that that is exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. Like no doubt about it. I wanted to be in that weight room working with athletes for the rest of my career. So at the time I, I didn't really realize that, they were actually looking to bring somebody in to take over, but it's just like phenomenal to me how everything has like fallen into place in terms of, you know, just like that particular football team and how everybody, you know, just wants to, the entire organization puts each other in positions to be successful and whatever that means, as well as our athletes. So that's something that I'm, you know, really, really proud of. Um, so I spent two seasons with football and wrestling. And then um, in 2019, I think it was 2019, I took over pretty much we had we the school and I came up with a plan to do all of the sports at that point, because um, other coaches were asking Hey, why can't we get her? <laughs> um, so, you know, it took a, took a while to come to like a, an agreement on uh, a contract for that. Um, but happy that we did. And then COVID hit, which kind of shut everything down, obviously for a while, but um, pretty much since like November of 2020, um, really January of this year, um, we've been consistently back in the weight room um, with, you know, got the spring teams ready and, and uh, up and running and their seasons are going really well right now. Um, and then right now I've got all of the fall teams. So it's, it's kind of crazy. The schedule is a little nuts right now. Let me stop you there. Cause I want to, I want to touch on something you said, cause I, I kind of light up when you, you know, that energy comes through when you start yeah. talking about you first went in the weight room and, and, and that kind of drove you. I want to come back to the development of the performance pack and what you've done long-term and scaled up. But I want to, I want to dive into that relationship piece. That's yeah. you know our theme for this year. If you look at, when you think about what, you know, the first charge you felt yeah. when you came okay. in, so how do you approach as far as just the relationships with those ball players, you know, that relationship, you know, the from the first day and I am now seeing my interns go through kind of something similar, but you know, the first day I had no idea how I was going to build relationships with 70 athletes on one team. And, um, you know, for me, I just, I honestly spent like the first week just observing. I didn't even, I didn't open my mouth to coach at all. Um, in fact, they had to tell me, you know, you can coach these kids up. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, I just, I'm trying to like get the lay of the land. I'm trying to understand as a female, obviously I did not play football. I only knew what my husband told me about his experience as a college football player. So that is great. It's helpful to a degree, but I felt like, how can I come into this space not having ever experienced anything like this, um, you know, in the sports that I played in high school and, and, and be of value, right? I mean, I, I, that was my big question in my head, like, how am I going to be of value? And it, it's clear in that space, you cannot fake something that you don't have. Right. Right. So I knew that right off the bat. I'm like, if I even act like... I know the X's and O's like these guys do of football is going to be, I'm going to be exposed. So, you know, I was really honest with the coaches and the team. I don't know the X's and O's of football, but I do know them of movement and strength and, you know, preventing injuries. And so it was interesting at first because as a female, I think that first group of guys, you know, the athletes thought, I would be more like a team mom and were would kind of look for some, some of them would kind of look for some coddling 
I think like, oh, my knee is killing me. Like I was going to like, you know, fall apart and be like, oh my God, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, all right, well, where does it hurt? You know, do you need to see the trainer? And, and then, well, yeah, I saw the trainer. They said it, it's fine. And I'm like, well, then get back in the rack, you know? And, and they're like, what? And so I think, you know, <laughs> the, we had to have some conversations in the beginning. Like you guys, I am not your mom you know, I am your coach. I'm here to make you better. I'm not here to baby you. Now, if something is really wrong, we need to talk about it. So we can figure out how to work with the medical, you know, athletic training staff and, and work through it or around it. But I'm not here to let you off the hook. Like that is not, that's not what you're going to get from me. Um, I do recall the first day that the lift was going really badly they were not focused. They were goofing off and, you know, in the weight room, I'll allow a certain amount, but when it gets dangerous, then, you know, that's my rule is no one gets hurt in the weight room. So yeah. I remember the first time I blew the whistle and told everyone to strip their bars and rack it and clean up and, and just shut the lift down. And I was like, shut the lift down, go to the turf. We're going to run. And they're like, what, why? And I'm like, because I, I gave them, you know, like three warnings. And that was like the first time. And I kind of like lost it that day in a way that I thought I'm going to get fired. These are other people's children, you know? And I just, I raised my voice and I'd never like really done it, but I just was like, I'd had it, you know, they were pushing me. They were pushing me to see sure. how far I was going to go. And I just was like, that's it. Racket hit the turf. And that it was like, a bunch of like, you know, big eye eyeballs, biggest a wake up call. Yeah. And I came home and I told my husband, I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get fired. I, I, I kind of went off and he was started laughing. He's like, you're not going to get fired for that. And he was like, it's about time. You've been complaining about, you know, lack of focus for like a couple of weeks now. So anyway, that was kind of like the pivotal moment for me. And, and it was, you know, in that time frame that I realized the relationship itself, first of all, you know, we have, to, I have to have a relationship with the entire team and then different personalities of our athletes have different needs, right. And our approach may be the same, but there, there might be nuances that are a little bit different. Um, some kids are thicker skinned than others. I, my goal is to help kids develop a thick skin so they can take constructive criticism and be able to immediately apply it to get better. Um, and, um, my athletes now know that I love them to death and, but I am brutally honest because we don't have time for me to dance around, um, performance issues. You mm -hmm. know, we don't, we have, we have limited time with these kids and, and we have to put them on a field. And, and it's, I always say football is not like a collision or a contact sport. It's a collision sport, sure. which is different. The demands are different and the durability um, needs are um, heightened, uh, you know, compared to other sports. So, you know, developing that trust of, um, you know, yeah, this is hard and, and it feels terrible right now, but here's how you can get better. Um, here's what I need from you. I have really high expectations um, of my athletes. I, spe I expect everyone to show up to every single session. Um, and if they don't, they're getting messages from me. Where are you? Do you have, do you have issues with rides? You know, because sometimes kids have things going on at home that, you know, you can't, um, they can't necessarily control. Sometimes they're just hiding. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's my job to build the relationships, to get to the bottom of that. And it's, and it takes a while too. And that would be like my advice to any strength coaches to be careful about coming in hot to a new situation or to a new team who's not familiar with you yet, because, um, you do have to establish the relationships and figure out, you know, the personality of that team as a whole. Let me ask you something. Cause you just, you just struck the word trust. And, and I know that you know, there's a, there's a background issue, an authority issue for any coach in any position mm -hmm. when they come in new and you have to earn that trust. Now, mm -hmm. having watched a lot of your videos and looking at some of the, the demonstration videos that you put up and have on your website and stuff, it's, it's incredible the degree to which, um, you know, you've developed 
a wide range of very creative exercises. How much when you went in the weight room and were able to demonstrate that stuff mm -hmm. to these kids, do you feel like that helped build that trust and earn the respect a little oh, bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I think as a strength coach, especially as a female strength coach, it's important that I be able to execute everything that I'm asking my athletes to execute. I have to teach it and I have to demonstrate and coach it. Right. So, um, that doesn't mean I'm squatting 400 pounds. I'm not, right. I, as long as I can demo demonstrate it. And I always tell, you know, new hires and interns, as long as you can demonstrate it with the bar, that's 45 pounds. That's all I need you to do. Um, and I teach coaches as well, how to demonstrate things without, if they have like an injury or something. So there's always, you know, that work around, but as the person who's in charge all year long of, making sure these kids are ready to take the field in August, it is important for me to walk the talk, right? So I have to be able to do those things. Um, and I have to take care of my body too. I have to preserve it so that I can sure. do that work. Right. So, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and you know, it's always my goal that all of my athletes are stronger than me. Um, you know, so if, you know, and that's kind of a marker, like if, if, you know, if I can do more than in a, in poundage, you know, than, um, than another athlete, depending on how old that person is, I'm like, okay, your next goal is to be able to do more than me. So, you know, you have to be, you have to be able to do more than your coach. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think that, I think some people would disagree. Um, I think some strength coaches would disagree for me. I just don't see how I can be sharp um, and great at what I do if I can't execute and then, you know, use that as my mechanism for trust, because like I said, we're asking them to do things that are really hard sure. every day. How do you think that, um, kind of springboarding off of that, you know, building those types of relationships in the weight room, how do you think that that has helped you as being responsible for all the sports when it extends outside the weight room to those other sports beyond football and, and building those relationships with other athletes? Yeah. So, you know, the um, football to me, like if you can run a football strength and conditioning program from off pre and in season, um, you can run any program. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, it's, it's just different. And I know, you know, it's like the soccer people, if they're listening to this are going to be mad um, because I am also a trainer for soccer and lacrosse and golf and tennis and um, swimming, right? It, the, the energy system demands and the durability demands have to be taken into account. So sure. in the football space, that is the most difficult, um, you know, thing to tackle. So um, that being said, though, the soccer team is doing what the football team is doing, but there are nuances to it that are different. Um, my throwing athletes are generally doing what the football team does, but we're taking special care of the shoulder, just like I do with my quarterbacks. So, you know, it's, it's generally the same. Um, the nuances are different. Uh, no, we're probably not going to have a whole lot of soccer players squatting 445 pounds like we had you know, test squat test day yesterday. And I had a kid squat 445 pounds as his max, um, with really great form. And that's probably not going to happen, um, with our soccer players. If that's not what the goal is, right. The goal is for every athlete to, um, get as strong and as fast as they possibly can, um, within that space. So yes, the whole teams and other teams are doing same or similar workouts, but everything is scaled so that the athlete can um, work within their range, like wherever they are on the spectrum. And then, you know, we just work to move the needle from there. From a relationship standpoint, um, it was, I think, the first time I had other teams in the weight room. I think that they were a little scared um, because, you know, you've probably seen football lifts before. They can get really intense. And... Mm -hmm. If, you know, if someone, if another team had been in the facility at the time and saw that they might be a little bit like, Ooh, I don't know. Right. There, nobody's in between on that. You either don't want any part of it or you're like, Hey, what are they doing in there? And you want to know. Right. So, um, I think, you know, there, I had to kind of sell 
me to those other athletes from the other teams in a way like, um, you know, you guys are capable of doing these things and, um, you know, don't worry about whether or not it's going to be crazy, insane, intense in here. Don't worry about right now, because we're going to start where you are and, um, you know, just building that trust. And then now that we've got more girls teams in there, um, one of the things that I noticed, you know, with the girls is, um, you know, that still by and large, it doesn't even occur to girls to lift weights or to be in the weight room. And I think that me being a female on campus has definitely shed some light on that. Right. Um, and I think it's been eye opening for the coaches. It's been eye opening for the female athletes for sure. Um, and I always tell the girls, you're stronger than you think you are. The boys are always not as strong as they think they are. Like it's, it's two completely different, you know, um, mental dynamics, but the goal is, you know, to get the girls to the point where they realize how capable they are. And, you know, want to go after those strength gains and those speed gains. Um, and so I kind of create like a little bit of competition amongst the teams. And, you know, I'll tell the girls, I'm like, if they, you know, if they do, so, if they execute a lift better than the majority of my boys, well, like you guys do that better than the boys do. And you can tell them that when you see them in the hallway, you know, or in class, you can tell them. Coach Mel said that. I yeah. So I kind of create like that little you know, buzz around them. But I also want my kids who have been in the weight room with me for four years. I want them to be encouraging to the kids who are just now, you know, getting in there. So. Sure. And I, I know that uh, there was a time where I was training a group in speed and agility, and it was just an open group of kids of different ages that spanned about five years. But during that same time frame, I was training an eight-year-old tennis phenom, I was training a 13 year old swimmer who was getting ready to move up to be a 14 year old and in swimming, they work in two year bands. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm assuming you have the same drive. The reason that excited me is because with each athlete comes a different set of parameters and it really made me be a student of my profession and be right. on my game and say, you know, I got to work with the swim coach is for his in the pool stuff to make sure what I'm doing on dry land doesn't negate Correct. what they're doing in the pool and, and with this with trying to communicate the specifics to an eight-year-old you know who's playing up up against 12 year olds in tennis um with, sorry, so that kind of stuff is exciting and i imagine you have that same dynamic but i think probably the thing that i applaud more than anything else is is the fact that it's just great for female athletes to see someone who looks like them and, mm -hmm. you know, and doing successfully what you're doing and, and guiding them, because I, my own experience with my daughter, who's 27 and, and, a, and a CrossFit athlete, is that you're exactly right. Most women and girls specifically don't give themselves enough credit for how strong they can be. Um, right. and, and not that we're trying to make bodybuilders out of everybody, but just, you know, too many times our society says, oh, girls are weaker, you know, that and they, and they, yeah. and they begin to believe that. And the reality is completely different. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's get into a little bit on the injury prevention side, you know, throughout the pandemic and certainly in the fall for those programs in college that had football and then the NFL, mm -hmm. um, uh, we saw, in my opinion, and I kind of made a conscious effort to track it. We saw an increase in the number of injuries, particularly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, knees and ankles type of stuff, you know, the more running and cutting related injuries that put stress on the lower body for football athletes. How much of that do you think was brought on by the fact that in many cases, the beginning and or middle of conditioning for off season was done in isolation versus being able to get in and hold people accountable and all that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it has, it definitely, was the contributing factor. I mean, we, you know, this, I told our coaches from the beginning, you know, because you had, we had five months off and then even for a lot of teams, when they were able to go back to training, it was so limited because weight rooms were limiting how many kids could be in the weight room at sure. one time. Right. So to give you an example, in a typical summer, I would have our kids in the weight room four days a week for at least an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. 
And then we would go and do like speed and agility, um, you know, for the next, for the next half hour. So like, you know, for two hour days, um, four days a week, but after COVID, when we finally got to the weight room, which wasn't even until like, Oh gosh, I think it was Jill. I had six weeks basically mm -hmm. to get them ready. Um, I got three 30 minute sessions. Wow. <laughs> so look, I mean, it's impossible. It's not possible. We're not getting stronger in 30 minutes after five months off. We're just not. And so, you know, at that point it was conversations like, well, what are we going to do? And, you know, my whole recommendation was, I think you should just teach these kids football. I don't, I don't think that I'm going to be able to make that much of a difference. And coach was like, well, we're not going to not train at all. We're not going to not lift at all. Um, but I, I said, but you just need to know that what we're putting on the field this year is not going to look anything like it did last year. And there, we're going to have injuries. We're going to have some knee injuries. And um, we did. And, um, you know, I, and I said, and we're going to have some strange injuries that we're not really prepared for, for us, um, for my team, that was hand injuries, Interesting. which I'm sure is linked to not holding anything heavy <laughs> for, you know what I mean? Like, cause we do a lot of, um, you know, grip strength stuff. Sure. We do farmer sure. carries and, you know, all those things. And I just think it was, it was insane how many hand injuries, broken fingers, uh, dislocated thumbs. We'd never had those um, before. We had two catastrophic knee injuries. I hadn't had one in the, in the years that I was there before that. Wow. Um, and in the two athletes that had those injuries, they were pretty MIA during the quarantine. So I created workouts for our kids in quarantine. And some kids had um, gyms at home and, and some didn't have anything at all. Um, and some of these kids did a really great job working with just a few dumbbells and you could tell, uh, you know, who was committed to, um, training during quarantine. And so of course we lose kids, you know, and, and, um, you know, I, that just is what it is. I, I never, you know, really had judgment on their accountability during that sure. time. So I think it's unfair to say, um, Hey kid who just had everything taken away from you that you love go do push-ups and body weight squats and sprint, you know, a few days a week. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, a, it's an unrealistic expectation. So definitely, um, you know, saw a lot of those and was not surprised at all. We had serious performance issues, um, had a lot of freshmen who just didn't even get a chance to be in the weight room very much. And um, who also didn't even really know how to play football that we had to put on a field on Friday night because we just had, um, come off of a year where we had 23 seniors graduate. So wow. yeah, it was, it was, um, a pretty terrible season <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but it wasn't unexpected. It, it was exactly what I expected and, you know, schools that I work with, um, and then other teams that I don't necessarily work with, but I'm kind of in, you know, constant communication with, there's been some teams that have gotten really lucky and haven't had any. And I'm like, I don't even know how that's possible. Um, but yeah, a lot of ankles, a lot of knees, um, a lot of hamstring strains, um, not on my team. Cause that's the one thing that I knew we could prevent by not going too hard, too long, too fast in, uh, the speed training. Mm -hmm. Right. So those teams that day one were running forties, chronic hamstring strains. Um, and so that was, you know, that was one of my things was like, I, I know I can at least prevent that. Um, but you know, that being said, we had to choose between being conditioned and being fast and, um, you know, we had to go with fast, although even that was such a limited uh, availability, sure. um, you know, in that time frame. Let me, you know, something that became very apparent to me and, and it was, uh, it was really, I, I was blessed to be able to attend three of the NFL youth football summits, um, back between say 05 and 2010. And uh, uh, I, I got to meet Bill Parisi and uh, I, I had also met Don Beebe. So I kind of, from both those guys who were Kings in the, in the uh, probably the prosecution, if you will, of dynamic range of motion warmups and really guided my, cause I grew up in an era where everything was, you know, static stretch yeah. and, and it, and it built the value for me that dynamic was going to not only 
help you warm up more appropriately, but also mm -hmm. get your muscles better prepared and, and, and build toward injury prevention. So having mm -hmm. gone through all the stuff you just said, and I, cause I've looked at some of your, I love some of your videos and, and the, the way you blend the whole dynamic range of motion, you know, stretch routines into what you do um, almost in kind of a, kind of a yoga style um, in some of them, you know, as far as the stretching and movement goes, mm -hmm. how, how much has this experience reinforced for you and maybe even made it more important to build that type stuff into your program and teach others to do that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's really important. You know, the flexibility is a big issue, especially for football players. Um, and, you know, especially for our linemen um, in that hip area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a fan of dedicating a whole day to stretching, whether it's dynamic or static or active or, you know, whatever. Um, because I, I think if your warm up is run really well, that stuff should take place in, in that warm up. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why I've spent like a lot of time just kind of like reworking my warm ups over time to include, you know, an active stretch, act, um, dynamic range of motion, but also teaching the athletes how to do that with intent, right? So what are we doing um, when we're doing, uh, you know, a quad pull or a uh, walking RDL? Why are we doing, a, you know, lateral lunge, um, you know, and what is that stretching and just trying to, you know, encourage them to really think about what are the muscle groups that we're trying to get warmed up right now? Um, and then you're always going to have those kids who just are wound really, really tight. And those kids do need some extra work outside of, um, you know, what we do in, uh, you know, team training and, and practice. Um, so for all of my athletes that I work with across all sports and schools, um, I created a, just a total joint and tissue. I call it a recovery program. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's basically dynamic stretches, active stretches, and some, um, like joint related things, um, in terms of like joint stability. So it's not really like a workout at all. Some of it looks like yoga. Some of it looks a little more like physical therapy, which is really more in the corrective exercise realm. Um, and so some of those athletes know, you know, if you, if you want to get a deeper squat, you're going to have to do this stuff on your own. So I have it in my app and, um, I encourage them to do that on Sundays to just kind of establish a good, you know, foundation and, um, you know, joint availability, uh, for the week and, but they can access that at any time. Um, and, and it goes from the toes all the way up to the neck. So they can just kind of pick, all right, if my hamstrings are bothering me, I'm going to go to the hamstring stuff. If my hips are tight, I'm going to go to the hip stuff. Um, and it's just kind of a resource um, that, and we'll do, if we have like 10 minutes left over after a lift, like if we finish early after a training session, then um, we will go through some of those things together, which they're constantly asking for. So it used to be they hated stretching and now they're asking for stretching because once, you know, once they understand that that actually just makes them feel better, um, then they're, then they're going to want more of it. But that was a sell too, right? It was like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's for girls or yoga people or, you know, whatever. And then, and now it's like, Hey, coach Mel, can you give me, can you show me that hip stretch again? Right. So awesome. it's, again, it's just like establishing that trust and, and having that relationship and, you know, projecting the fact that, um, you know, these things will help you. And it's all in that thread of, you know, wanting to get better, wanting to help you feel better. Cause that's a big component. Sure. Um, athletes that don't feel great who are, you know, feel stiff are, are going to underperform. So. Well, and I'm experiencing that right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going through some, uh, with a guy who's not only a certified athletic trainer, but he's also a certified physical therapist. So I'm yeah. doing some stuff for my shoulder and, and it, and it's hard when you are stiff and sore, it is hard to overcome that mentally and say, okay, yes. I'm going to force myself through this. And young people generally have not developed the persistence, uh, and the grit to do that many times. Right. So that's important to introduce them to that. Let's, let's transition a little bit. I, I'd love to, uh, 
let folks know a little bit more about what you do specifically mm -hmm. within what you the platform you call the performance pack and mm -hmm. and um not not so much to to sell it to anybody but just in terms of the philosophy with which mm -hmm. you know you educate other coaches and and or athletes uh, as you go forward so talk a little bit about the app and and you know what it brings to a program and what you can do with it sure well the performance pack happened in quarantine and it was a result of my overwhelming desire to feel useful. Honestly, it just really, it started from that. I was losing my mind, not having <laughs> anything to do. So I was like, what can I do that will help, you know, people. So the athletes are already using the app and, um, you know, doing their workouts as much as, you know, we could track them down and get them to do so. But I, I thought it would be really nice as coaches were scrambling to um, get more continuing education. Um, and it really happened as a result of me wanting to educate coaches, but also seeing that there was also a gap in that industry in terms of coach education. It's one thing to just watch a YouTube video and, you know, see a dynamic stretch or see a lift or an acceleration drill or a speed drill or uh, injury prevention stuff, but who's going to teach these coaches how to teach coach and correct all of these movements, sure. right? So that's me. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and that's how, so that's how that started. So what I started to do was just every week I filmed content that I basically went from the standpoint of if I had to teach someone how to do what I do and not ever see them, what would this content look like. And, but I didn't want to leave it at the, um, instructional content. I wanted to actually be, uh, to have interactions with the coaches that just like I do, you know, with athletes. Sure. Um, and so I just kind of like dipped my toe in the water. I just happened to have a couple of coaches reach out to me from like a school in Illinois and another school in Louisiana. It was just kind of random. And I was like, Hey, here's the deal. I'm working on this thing. I don't know what's going to become of it, but if you're, I'll, you know, I'll do it for really cheap. Um, because I'm building it. If, if you're okay with me building this as we go, then, you know, here's, here's what the deal is. And they're like, yeah, sure. Um, and so at first the content was really based on what they wanted to know. <laughs> and so, cause I was like, all right, great. Yeah, I can do one for that. No problem. Um, so just started creating these videos and helping them understand programming, um, and why, like, why do we program the way we do? What should a warm up look out look like? What is the order in which your movements in the warm up should go? And then of course, always why. And then there's the how, how do you, how do you teach this to your athletes when you guys are back, you know, on site and training? And um, so I just simplified my system of teach, coach, and correct the same system I use with my athletes. I now just teach coaches how to do that. Right. So um, now what that looks like is what's called the performance pack. And so essentially the performance pack is it can be for one team or entire schools. Um, and it really services schools who would like to have a strength coach on site, but they just don't have the budget for one. Or I've actually been talking to a lot of schools who might have the budget for a strength coach, but how do they find one? How do they know? Mm -hmm. How do they know that who they're interviewing is even capable of doing this work? How do they know it's a good fit? Um, so essentially, you know, and, and the majority of schools are just not going to have the budget for somebody with as much you know, credentials and qualifications and experience as I have. So my thought process behind the performance pack was let's just help coaches do it and have really great programs that they can execute by themselves that will save them time, not create more work for them. Um, that helps them build cultures in the off season, because that's very difficult to do if you're you know, if you're just seeing these athletes for the first time a week before tryouts, sure. um, you know, that's, that's really hard to build a culture in those situations. And so just kind of like bringing like the whole piece of the puzzle together. Um, so it starts with an audit. I just, I talk to the coaches and the athletic directors and we talk about win loss records, uh, injuries, what are their big frustrations? What are the performance blocks and the, and the big issues? Um, 
What do, what do they have at their facility? Some don't have anything at all. That's okay. We'll figure it out. Um, and what are you already doing? And so it just, I just work to identify the gaps and then every gap is a bucket and we just work to filling those buckets, um, as quickly as possible. So it's educational content that's recorded, but then it's also hands-on consulting with me directly. That's awesome. And you hit on a couple of things that I think, um, that I think are important. One from each side, the athlete and the coach side. One is that what I have found over the last couple of decades is that athletes just in general ask questions. Whereas Mm -hmm. when I was young, coach said, jump, we said, how high Mm -hmm. now coach says do this. And they say, well, why are we doing that? So if you approach your instruction from the standpoint that I'm going to explain, this is what I do during my DROMs. When I do a 15 minute dynamic range of motion warm up, I'm talking the whole time. I demonstrate yeah. and then I talk. And as they're doing it, I'm saying, hey, you're doing this because we want to loosen the hip girdle up. Yep. We want to da da da. And the other thing is for coaches, many coaches, what's so effective about the performance pack is that many coaches do what they were taught, they do yeah. what they grew up doing. Yeah. And for anybody that's either, in between us in age or older yes. than me, that they, they they probably learned a lot of really bad techniques. Yeah. And and in in as much as you can protect the athlete simply by making sure you know that balance and weight distribution and and posture are correct right. before you ever start adding weight to the equation. Correct. You know, it's it it makes a huge difference. So let's talk about and to kind of kind of round this out and, and uh, move toward close. I, I, I have to constantly be careful. I'm a guy who takes 10 minutes to do a three minute closing. So um, <laughs> I, uh, when you consider the other components of an athlete's health and well-being mm-hmm. at, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, talk a little bit about either what you share with coaches to reinforce or with athletes from the standpoint of the other components of health and well-being as an athlete, you know, how important is the sleep that they're getting and the quality of that sleep? How important is the nutrition and what should they put? So talk a little bit about that specifically focused on sleep and nutrition as components of their program. Uh, Yeah, it's so critical. Um, You know, right now, kids and and dads want to know, you know, should he be, um, should he be using creatine? That's for some reason, I don't know, like it, the creatine is like a really big push right now. Um, And so, you know, my advice is always like, let's focus on real food first and see if, you know, we can get him to where we want to be. Um, As you know, in in football, if if an athlete is going to play at the next level, there are certain positions you won't get looked at if you don't, if you aren't a certain size. Right. Right. Fact of life, so, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and it, that just is what it is. Um, so we do want to put pounds on these kids and we have goals, you know, I, it, there are kids in my weight room. Like I'd like to see you put on 10 pounds between now and uh, August. Right. So, and here's how we're going to do that. Um, I have to be really careful in the state of Ohio. I don't have like nutrition certifications that actually qualify me to, um, you know, write diets. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it is, it's a lot of the common sense stuff, like, um, you know, making sure that, that these kids are getting protein at every meal instead of a pop tart, a pop tart does not have protein in it. Right. (laughs) Um, so we want them eating eggs and meat and rice and potatoes and vegetables and fruit and nuts. Uh, we want them eating sandwiches on whole, whole grain bread and, you know, things like that, wherever possible. The funny thing is, is what I run into mostly is kids who just aren't eating enough right or it blows my mind still to this day that someone could forget to eat lunch when you have a dedicated period at school to eat lunch like how did you forget did you not have lunch did you not have money no i did i just was talking to my friends and i'm like okay that is that makes absolutely no sense so we have those conversations quite a bit Um, and I have some friends, you know, in the like dietetics field and actually getting ready to set up, um, getting ready to set up, uh, like a zoom, uh, thing with one of my friends who's a dietitian who can give like some really specific guidelines also on supplements. I can't recommend supplements, but I can warn against, um, 
potentially harmful ingredients in, sure. you know, proteins and creatine powders and things like that. Um, so we are having those conversations. I just have to be really careful about it. So when I see a need, um, which I do right now, I will bring in somebody to, you know, be able to give some more specific guidelines. So nutrition is, you know, nutrition is really important. Um, it's also important that kids get proper sleep. Um, some people are just not good sleepers. Some people are just staying up way too late and on their phones for too long. I, I doubt that the majority of our athletes are really listening a whole lot when we tell them to, you know, shut the phone down after a certain time of night. Um, you know, my 11 year old daughter hates that we, we have an app that disables her phone at 10 PM. So she can only text us <laughs> and that's it. Nothing else works. Um, highly recommend that. Although I think, you know, we started that early with her. Um, we'll continue it through high school. We're not going to, we're not going to loosen the reins on that. Um, cause she's an athlete, very active. And I want her getting, you know, that sleep and that sure. recovery. Um, and so that one's a tougher sell, I think, but I also think that we have to keep on talking about it and we have to talk to parents and coaches and athletes about that, you know, ongoing. And then, you know, the third component, which has been really exposed during COVID is stress management Sure. and helping kids navigate really hard, um, you know, really hard situations, um, regarding COVID, but also I think it exposed maybe where we've missed the mark in recognizing need for stress management prior to COVID. And I hope sure. that we're doing a better job of that right now, you know? Um, it, and sometimes that looks like, you know, especially for our athletes who are still online, um, doing their school online, they have trouble getting rides to, you know, to come to the lifts. And so we do need to extend a little bit of, um, you know, grace to those athletes. We've had athletes with parents who got COVID and got really, really, really sick and, or who lost grandparents. And, um, so for me, that's changed how I approach, how I question kids about why they weren't there. Um, I'm very careful now about like, where, where I'm not like, where were you? Um, like, Hey, is everything okay? Exactly. You know, and start out that way. Right. Um, so I think it's changed how I approach our kids in terms of, are you okay? You know, what, are you going through something? It, you seem quiet. Um, and you know, I don't do it in front of other people. Um, but you know, I will flat out ask, like, if, if you're, if you're not okay, it's okay. And do, if you need help, if you need to talk to somebody and you need to have, if you want me to help you have a conversation with somebody that can help you, then, you know, I'm here, let me know. Um, the majority of my conversations like that typically happen after an injury where, um, and that's another thing that I think coaches need and parents need to be really, really aware of is, um, how depressed kids can get even after minor injuries, um, you know, losing playing time, potentially being out for, you know, two, sometimes four weeks for even, you know, minor strains is, um, can definitely send a kid into a dark place. Um, I think, you know, for me, I recognize it because I have, I have a 25 year old who as a senior in high school was severely depressed and suicidal. Um, and I did not know what depression looked like before he went through that. So I know what it looks like now, you know, so, and, and I know what the levels of it looked like, cause his started like really, really mild and we didn't know we just thought it was like normal teenage stuff mm -hmm. and it escalated. So we, the help, we didn't get him the help until it had escalated to the point where it was like life or death. Right. So, uh, I, you can kind of tell, or I can kind of tell when a kid is going into, you know, that dark space and I'll just flat out ask him, like, are you okay? You look like you're, you look like you're in a dark place. You know, is this something you can pull yourself out of? Do you want to talk? Do you need help? And, Kids will be honest with me actually about that, um, which I'm really glad that they are. And, you know, and then we'll just talk about like, what is it? What is it that's making you feel that way? Well, it's just the injury and, you know, I'm really bummed. And I'll be like, all right, I'll tell you what, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you two days to feel sorry for yourself. 
day three, we're going to work on all of the other body parts that we can work on and get strong. We're going to work with the athletic trainers, figure out how to overcome this injury, how to get you back on the field as quickly as possible. And then when that athlete knows that there's like a team of people who are trying to help them get back on the field, it kind of changes, you know, it changes that situation. So, um, but I do think stress management, um, and recognizing, I just saw a tweet from a strength coach the other day about having an athlete have a panic attack in the middle of, it just came out of nowhere. Um, well, it never comes out of nowhere. Right. But it seemingly comes out of nowhere. And, um, the, how different we all are now in, you know, recognizing those situations and not, you know, approaching that from the, you know, Oh, come on, toughen up, you know, yeah. mind frame. I think what our, what our kids lost was profound. Um, we all experienced loss to a degree. And some of them, some of us actually experienced the loss of actual family members. Sure. Right. So we're all different now. We're all changed and um, our kids are too. And so I think, you know, we have to be careful about how we approach those situations. Yeah, I, I agree. I've got a good friend who is a head football coach and school counselor in Pennsylvania. And he has on numerous occasions talked about the same approach that you have developed. It's about, you know, you don't know when that kid comes in and is having a bad day, did they, yeah. did they miss a meal that day? Did they not get sleep? Could there be something bad going on in their home? And right. it's so much more, uh, personal and and so much more empathetic if you will to be able to talk to them on a human level and say hey what's going on what you know just talk right. to me that's all i'm asking because you hit on a lot of great stuff there i mean i think that most kids don't realize how important the sleep component is from mm-hmm. the process that happens up here it's it's the you know the the fact that your brain clears out plaque and helps you recover and and right. reform connections while you're sleeping the fact right. that that nutrition gives you the right stores within your body to be able to do that right. and then obviously all the stuff we've seen with the elevated um uh levels of anxiety depression yeah. you know suicide among young people i mean and among adults spousal abuse you know yeah. domestic violence things like that and we've just got to be more if if covid taught us nothing it should at least have taught us that the compassion and the empathy required to be in the positions we are when we are coaching young people is is so critical to their success going forward, whether they ever go to the next level as an athlete or not, just as the, to be good people. So I really appreciate it. Um, If you were like kind of a parting shot Mm -hmm. um, from your, uh, from your foxhole, as we say in the military, um, if you were going to, you know, give a young person just general advice uh, from your position as a strength and conditioning coach, um, what kind of, you know, general athletic talk would you give a kid who's you know, maybe, maybe that freshman you talked about earlier that didn't have a chance to do all the stuff that he or she should have done prior to their season. Um, wh- what do you give them in terms of that overall coach Mel pep talk to say, here's what you need to do to get started. Yeah. So all they really have to do is just show up. <laughs> that's it. You know, I, that's what I tell the young guys, um, you know, is to just keep showing up and look around and, and look at the, you know, look at the players, look at the body sizes, look at the abilities. Everybody here started from somewhere. And that is where that young freshman currently is. And, you know, to have, we talk about that a lot with, especially this time of year, because um, incoming ninth graders are allowed to now train um, with our team as eighth graders and as long as they're enrolled. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to, you know, have those older guys, um, you know, be the example of what is possible in the weight room. Um, and then once summer, you know, once summer hits, then we'll, we'll be talking about what's possible on the field. And, um, you know, it's okay to start at the bottom and to just slowly work your way up you know, to what your full potential is. And, you know, this year with our guys, um, we're grateful. Um, and that's my thing. Like, like every week I, on Fridays, we talk about gratitude and to be thankful that we get to train, that we have a massive facility to train in. Cause a lot of schools I work with don't have any, um, facility at all. 
um, you know, grateful that um, we're going to get to play football in, in a normal season, most sure. likely, unless something really goes wrong. Um, you know, and then grateful for, you know, just to be together and to be like that family. Um, but other than that, my expectation is not big, massive improvements every time. It's just 1%. I, I, we go by the 1% rule. So we get better, we get 1% better every day. And my commitment to them is that what I do, I get 1% better at every day as well. Right. So I'm going to walk that, I'm going to walk that talk and, make sure that I'm holding myself accountable so I can be the best coach possible. And I just want them to do the same. And then, and then the commitment is to trust that process and, sure. um, you know, to understand that I got you. And by the time August gets here, you are going to be ready. No doubt about it. You're going to be ready. So, and, and like literally all they have to do is just show up, just show up and do the work and be willing to be uncomfortable. Yeah, I love that philosophy. You know, too often I find that, uh, it, and it starts with adults because we've been conditioned otherwise, is, yeah. is to, to really celebrate the small wins. And that 1% can be huge, you mm -hmm. know, when it accrues over time. And so you get the compounding effect. Absolutely. Coach Mel, where can folks find you on social media? Um, Facebook under Melanie Red or Melanie Red Performance Training. Instagram is Melanie Red One. And Twitter is at coach underscore Mel underscore red. I think, I don't even know, um, something like that. Uh, but yeah. And then the website is www.mrperformancetraining.com. The MR stands for Melanie red, not Mr. <laughs> Well, and for those that, that may not catch on uh, and look, the red has two D's, R-E-D-D, -D, um, to make sure that everybody understands. Well, yeah. Coach Mel, I, I genuinely appreciate having been able to chat with you at length a couple of times before, but today for all the perspective and expertise that you bring to the table in sharing this, I mean, it's the kind of subjects and the kind of thing that, you know, we could talk about for hours, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to include all of the... Uh, all of this kind of information to where people can get to you or, or look at what you do online when we get to the show notes. And uh, I wish you all the luck in the world at uh, Chaminade Julianne in the fall with, uh, with football thank specifically, you. but with all thank the, you. all the kids. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to be with us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Well, listen, guys, I, I hope that you'll uh, reach out and find coach red in social media, take a look at her website. And if, and if you are a coach, in need of some help in those areas that she talked about, by all means, reach out to her. And uh, she has a, a, a lot of engagement uh, on Facebook. And that's actually where I first encountered her. So uh, I definitely say lean on her expertise. And uh, thanks again for joining us on For the Good of the Game. And until next time, take care and God bless. <laughs>